All right, hi everyone. <laughs> <laughs> this will make some good bloopers after. <laughs> I am a walking blooper reel, honestly. <laughs> That's, <laughs> That's like, so real. That's yeah. Me when, did you see my um, video of me interviewing the rally driver, Louise? Yeah, that was walk? good. That was <laughs> I was like, so yeah, where I am I? I like that one. <laughs> it, was, it was not quite my finest That was moment. a good clip. <laughs> it was definitely a good blooper. <laughs> <laughs> I have noticed a lot of these like a lot of these like Zoom girl type recordings. It, it, they very often have like a the view that the hosts were like laughing like on the start clip because like the outtakes and were funny. F1 is finally back and we have just finished watching the Bahrain Grand Prix and I'm so excited to discuss it with my new co-host. So I'm gonna introduce you all to Neil. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm Neil uh, at Neil Bus Racing on all platforms. Uh, I am. A racing fan just like all of you and um yeah i've been i've been doing uh i am a racing driver as well as it turns out so i think uh really there's a lot to f1 uh, especially in the um not just the technical side but more importantly the sporting side in terms of the mentality and the techniques used by the drivers themselves which i feel goes really unexplained a lot of the time and i would love to tell you guys about that because yes. that's my I know doubt about that kind of stuff. So that's brilliant. That's my, that's my and I job. can <laughs> confirm Neil has some fantastic insight, even as a really experienced Formula One fan. You know, I thought I knew almost everything there is to know. There's so much more to learn and I'm always learning new things from Neil. So it's awesome that's what to the have good thing here. is about racing, because <laughs> there's so much going on in racing that you're always learning. I mean, even yeah. even the F1 drivers are yeah. always talking about learning. Every single lap they do is some extra bit of information yeah. to learn. So. And slightly off to topic, if you do want to show the viewers your wonderful race suit that's behind you. Um... <laughs> Ta da! Oh, no. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I, I try, as you, as you guys can see, I tried to hang it up in the background. Did yeah. not realize my huge head. <laughs> um, actually, my, my huge hair, let's see, is covering the entire thing. But that's okay. There. We've shown it off now. <laughs> so Yeah, we have. There we go. Well, where do we even start with this race? Because there's so much to unpack. There I feel was a like, lot going on. yeah, start of a season, there's always loads of talking points. So Definitely, I guess for you, yeah. what do you want to start with? Um, there's a lot of things to talk about in this race. For example, like uh, <laughs> the Ferrari is the most reliable Ferrari engine on it. Yes. <laughs> and it died. It died in the middle of the race. Oh, of course it did. no. Um, so th that's, for example, an, an interesting topic I would like to get into a little bit later in terms mm -hmm. of detail, because what is really great about the Bahrain Grand Prix and generally night races is because the surroundings are so much darker than day races, you can really see what the steering wheel display says. So I actually have a pretty solid theory, which I'm about 90% sure on, okay. on what actually caused Charles Leclerc's engine failure. Okay, um, what and was it? as Fred Vasseur said after the race, it's not the engine itself, but an engine accessory. And I know what that accessory might be um, because of what exclusive. the error message on the screen was. So that, that, I mean, it, okay. it may come out in due time. It may not. It may be disproven. They may mm. just claim whatever because it's a fun. At the end of the day, why mm. tell their rivals what the most fragile part of their engine is? It doesn't make much sense, does it? But I, I saw what I saw, so I can explain what that is, at the very least. As you can see here, on Charles Leclerc's steering wheel display, it actually says, box for refill. Now, a really interesting thing about F1, F1 engines compared to your road car engines is uh, the size. So F1 engines are, as we know, V6s, but um, they are specifically 1.6 liter V6s. And that is referring to the amount, how big the engine is, basically. Uh, and to give a sense of reference, like sports cars, generally are over two liters and supercars can go up to like five six seven liters the american ones go up to like eight nine ten muscle cars it's they can have huge engines even the um v10 cars from the early 2000s they were about three and a half liters off the top of my head i can't exactly remember but these are very tiny engines so the fact that they are able to squeeze so much power out of them is super interesting and one of the main ways it does this and one of the main ways it's able to maintain such a high rpm like as an example, an average road car, like um, the kind of ones that we'd see on the road, they probably wouldn't rev any higher than about 9,000. Like it would be its absolute maximum at 9,000 Can 9, I just RPM. ask, for the sake yeah, of myself of mostly, what's an yeah. RPM? Would that be right. revs per minute? <laughs> would I that, be... does mean, that does mean revs per minute. And basically that an engine, what does an engine do, right? It converts fuel into spinning. Right. So it, it RPM is just how much of the spinning <laughs> at that spinning. particular time. 
<laughs> Lovely. That, that is right. literally that is okay. literally all it does. No, that, that makes sense. That, and inc- we should include this in the podcast. We do not edit this part. <laughs> out. It's it's a very easy way of imagining it. All an engine does is convert energy from this form into that form. This form being chemical energy in the fuel, and that form being kinetic energy in the actual like dr- uh, drive shaft spinning, or the uh, crankshaft. Sorry. <laughs> I was so just saying like it's what? A spinning stick. <laughs> it's a spinning stick, and it uses the uh, energy from the fuel to convert it into spinning. now what the way it does this is by the process of internal combustion right it's an internal combustion engine <laughs> you know what like the f2 is... intro when they have that spinning thing yes is that it's that? that that's it right <laughs> yes it is I'm that with you. so yeah. it, there are these cylinders in a v6 there's six of them in a v formation like this ah. uh, and each of them each of them is a cylinder so we can ignore all, the other five let's just take one of them right and i'm sure we can I, i'll put some pictures up not just using my hands it'll be a bit easier to explain that way but it is essentially a volume of air and mm-hmm. there's a piston inside that goes up down up down up down up down um please ignore her suggestion of this 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 hand gesture <laughs> looks but the idea is right air comes in from the top air and fuel mixed together yeah. comes in from the top the uh, piston compresses it on its way up <laughs> then when it's fully it's okay it's okay guys we can get through <laughs> this i i promise i promise it is not as funny afterwards. i would love to make that way in fact, it's, more it in fact it's in fact it's more funny afterwards um so okay. this is the compre- this is called the the four stroke pattern this is how many <laughs> strokes we have yeah okay so when it okay. reaches the top of its first uh, of its compression stroke it compresses mm-hmm. the air because as you can imagine there's air and fuel there and it's pushing this space closed so when the space is closed it's compressed cool. when it's compressed it burns better so at this point when it's compressed there's a spark that's introduced and that ignites the fuel and that explodes we mm-hmm. have a little bit of internal combustion we do a little bit of internally combusting so it explodes and pushes the piston back down again and then now there is a bunch of combusted air here there's carbon dioxide basically that needs to go somewhere so that the next bit of fuel can come in so it opens up the exhaust valve and it again pushes it back up just with the momentum of spinning around like that it pushes it back up and all of that air gets pushed out from the exhaust valve which is great now the thing is because f1 engines rev all the way the rev limiter on these v6 cars is at 15000 rpm compared to a a, an average <laughs> it's a lot and compared to an average road car which is like 789 rpm like it's way lower f1 cars idle at 6000 like it's it's no one here in the wow. same ballpark but which is one of the ways they managed to squeeze so much horsepower out of such a tiny engine but as a consequence of that those valves one the valve which lets the air and fuel in and the valve which lets the exhaust out they would need to open really fast right they need to open and close like uh basically twice per actually once per rpm basically once per rotation it would need to open one time and that's a lot and if they've got that's a, very that's high. an insane yeah. large amount that's 15000 per minute which means please someone do the mental maths and put it on the screen somewhere <laughs> it would be 250 rpm well not rpm rps x number of times per second which is a lot it's a it's many times because you got to think about it this is a piece of metal vibrating around at that speed that's crazy fast so a normal spring operated valve from a road car it can't open and close that quickly it's just not happening what they do instead in f1 is they use a pneumatic valve system which means it uses jets of air to open the valve and close the valve at the right time which is like super precisely controlled and honestly it's genius it's 9 million iq but to be fair that's all we need to know about it right now so because they are opened and closed with jets of air that compressed air needs to come from somewhere so they have a reservoir for the air and they have a pump and what not but that pump needs to store that air and as it turns out what my theory is is that uh, assembly of the air reservoir and the pipe that leads to the cylinders somewhere in that it it like blew up so it's like a small part that failed as in not very big but yeah. clearly very important because as soon as the valves aren't getting air anymore the engine is still spinning without getting any air and fuel or exhaust or anything and obviously that is a situation which is not optimal if you don't have any fuel entering the <laughs> car you don't have any spinnies exiting the yes. car so not optimal um in certain circumstances it can also get to the point where it starts tearing the engine and, like the engine starts tearing itself apart which is not optimal so as one of the automatic uh, safety features safety features for the car once it detects that that has happened the air pressure in those cylinders there'll be a sensor there as air pressure drops to zero like or like rapidly decreases cuz it it's all flying out um it'll shut itself off 
which is why the commentators, for example, were speculating that it may have been an electrical issue because it just felt like the car just switched off. It yeah. didn't. It didn't like grind to a halt or anything like that. It just switched off because the car would have detected that this has gone horribly wrong. We need to switch yeah. it off right now. And the alternative um, would be if they hadn't. The, alter- the alternative would be that it would like start doing more damage, which would be like yeah. a huge problem over the course of the season. Because right. we got to remember they have an allocation of what four power units three power units something like that for the something entire like season that. yeah and there's 23 races including this one so they need to make this one last yeah biggest so, calendar yet as well so yeah it's they have a <laughs> lot of mileage to do on these engines yeah they can't be wasting stuff like this by le- just letting the engine run you know <laughs> if you're in the lead in like a williams and it's the last lap and then your engine gives this error sure fine by all means keep pushing yeah um right now not the time <laughs> which is why they stopped but an interesting thing is from what I can tell, and it's a little bit hard to get the details of this because they weren't really showing it that much. Yeah. Because he was so far off the back. I think Lando was having a similar issue. That's what I was um, about to ask, actually. Which is to say, so they were putting air into his car. They were. Car. They were. They said they stopped to put some more air in. And basically, I think that's a similar situation because um, basically, my speculation is that Charles' air system just like had a big bl- uh, burst in it, which completely let all of the air go. Yeah. But I think Lando's had more of Maybe a Maybe like a puncture. leak. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit of a leak. So every every few laps, they'd have to come in and like pump some more air in. Yeah. And in fact, the, the way I know this is in Spa of 2021 or 2020. I can't remember exactly. Uh, Charles actually had this issue where uh, they, they, had to, they had to call him in and they said, okay, and we have to stop for air refill. And he is like, okay, fine. So they changed the tires. And then for another five seconds, they were just holding like a bottle of air up to the yeah. engine cover. And he was like raging on the way out. And it was one of the, the reason I remember it is because he forgot to turn the radio off. And he like screamed profanities in French. Um, which obviously, oh, no. as a languages fan and a profanity fan, I found quite entertaining. <laughs> um, but it is interesting also from a technical aspect to know that yeah. there is this air system in the F1 cars and it can be filled up this way. Yeah, and it's not something we hear a lot about as well. Like, it's very interesting that we might have seen the same issue potentially two times on the grid when normally it's not a problem at all. So... That yeah, definitely. It's definitely one of those issues where you need to explain the whole, like, especially to, like, younger fans who are just getting into the concept of racing and stuff, or even cars, for that matter. Getting into that topic of, like, okay, this is how an engine works, this is why you need a valve, that is why we use air valves in F1 and nowhere else, and then the air valves can have... There's a lot of problems with explaining that all in the, in the space of one short interview or one short broadcast, but the podcast format is perfect for that. I guess let's talk about Charles DNF. Obviously, you yes. quite like him as a driver. Yeah, uh, I but can honestly, imagine. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think I'm picking favorites this season, no, especially. Like, no, It's not really my thing to do. I, I, I feel bad for the other drivers when I'm rooting for one of the others. But Charles is definitely one of the ones who have supported a lot since yeah. I started watching the sport. Um, so, I mean, how did yep. you feel when you saw that happening? Was it I like a... can't say I was surprised. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, no, that's the was... thing. It's happened so much lately, and you kind of yeah. begin to expect it, and it's kind yeah, of like oh, I was, I not was again. Like, um, <laughs> the, the setup I had going was like on my uh, sim rig screen. Actually, I can show you oh on the goodness. screen I had on my simulator. That is where I had the main broadcast up, and on my laptop and my second monitor of the laptop, I had like four onboards. So I had. Um, I want to say Alonso, Leclerc, Hamilton, and Albon as my Good four picks. Numbers. So I've watched, I've watched those quite a lot Good compared picks. to everyone else. So why so Hamilton? I, I mean, when he pulled off, it was just like, oh, like Hamilton <laughs> just because, you know, he's like, he's Hamilton, you know, I mean, yeah, look where yeah. he's starting compared to how good he is. I'm sure it'll be fun. And it was with Alonso, especially. Yeah. That was a great fight between those two. I love that fight. Like, <laughs> yeah. And, um, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, with, with, with Leclerc, I mean, honestly... It's just a typical Ferrari moment, you know? I mean, yeah. he he didn't have the pace for anything more than what he had. But yeah. he had the, he was in that kind of bubble, like in sort of no man's land, where he was like much quicker than everyone else behind him, but much slower than everyone in front of him. Yeah. So he was just kind of settled. And it went, I mean, um, <laughs> like... I guess, I guess that's an indicator yeah. of Ferrari's pace at the moment, that they yeah. aren't able... No matter I, I how they... well you drive, you just cannot catch the Red Bulls right now. Yes, and I think it's definitely also a matter of their long run pace. Um, Red Bull... Yes, in qualifying, they can turn it up and get one, more, one or two more tenths, but they're so close to that pace. Or, okay, well, it, the lap time is obviously slow because they have the fuel and the deployment, and yeah. uh, that is to say the energy recovery system and all that in a completely different mode. But in terms of the percentage of the limit that they can extract, sure, they have a little bit more in qualifying Red Bull, but in the race, they're so much closer to that limit compared to Ferrari, who have to slow down a lot more to actually manage it throughout the course of the entire race. And as we saw, 
even with the managing the engine didn't actually last the entire way yeah oh uh, one thing i saw people talking about was the fact that shell had to actually take an extra component or not an extra component he had to change some of his power unit components before the race today yeah um but that i wanted to dispel a one. bit of a misconception of Go that for it. from what i could tell i and obviously i wasn't like sitting refreshing the fia page to see what documents got published but from what i could tell he only changed the energy store right which is to say the battery Mm -hmm. Um so that's completely unrelated to the ICE which is the part that had the problem that right. is to say the internal combustion engine which is what had the problems today. So I don't think that will impact the season as a whole the change of component at the beginning. However the engine failure itself could have some pretty serious consequences in terms right. of taking great penalties later on in the season. So why would they change a component before a race has even started? Like what's the um, logic behind doing that? There could be a bunch of different reasons realistically speaking but I think the easiest one to speculate on and the one that i think is the least improbable is this, just the fact that they may have seen like a slight issue with it or like even just a tiny thing like i don't know where they mount the energy store in the ferrari because that that's the kind of thing that's completely different team to team the the packaging i kind of just assume different. it's in the back <laughs> it is it is behind the driver where behind the driver it varies from it's car somewhere to car. for example with mercedes is directly underneath the engine like right. right behind your ass if you're sitting uh, in the car the idea behind the matter is it could be something as minor as it shook around a lot in qualifying and the the like mounting bracket is wearing out a little bit too much so we'll reinforce that before we put this one back in because we don't want to risk shaking it for an entire grand prix distance so we put, put we put the new one in it's still within our allocation we can still use this one later it's fine that that kind of thing it's one of those preventative changes which if you asked me last year or even year before last especially would ferrari pick up on that kind of thing and actually do anything about it i would have said no way they would not have done that right. so honestly i'm glad that they're doing it and um, another thing with the call their qualifying call yesterday i was wondering i remembered because i was watching uh, i was actually out of town uh, yesterday and i was just watching it on my phone uh, in the wilderness and i was wondering oh, why shall out of the car i couldn't hear the commentator talking so i don't know right. i thought like there was some problem with the car yeah i mean um, we were confused out, as well to be honest yeah, as yeah, viewers yeah. as it turns out uh, he just decided that his first run was good enough and he'd save the set of tires for yeah. today and um that seemed to have been a good goal because him being able to start in a completely fresh set um really gave him that boost that he needed to keep p2 at the start and then only have to drop back to p3 after the yeah. first set of stops so that that was definitely a big win for ferrari which is something i wasn't saying very often last <laughs> yeah so i mean while you have a drink i'll, I'll talk about that lap 1 um so you know we saw it was mostly we were looking at the front kind of eight for that lap so we had yes obviously verstappen starting from pole um perez next to him leclerc behind and then sainz next to him we had alonso and then the two mercedes and then stroll i'd say those were our main characters of lap 1 yeah um, and alonso i mean of course no he wasn't i said him oh my bad <laughs> no it's okay he was he was behind the ferrari <laughs> i got right? lost in the list that's of okay. yeah he was he, you he was were enjoying your drink the yeah the mercedes jump jumped along so yeah I so i'll start from the start so we had verstappen got away well as he tends to do he did, yeah. um perez actually actually i, I would oh. dispute that point that's okay. actually been one of one of the red bull honda packages one of their biggest weaknesses i've noticed is their like clutch jump their clutch jump like the you... clutch was is like super aggressive like if you notice especially in the low grip races like Istanbul Park and all that yeah it, almost every time they would stall or like get the anti stall like yeah. they would have a horrible start every single time and even like it it goes all the way back to the beginning of the Red Bull Honda deal like in, even like 2019 right. like the Austrian Grand Prix one of the like best drives of Verstappen ever at the time i'm i'm yeah. sure he's done if yeah, i really yeah. think about it i'm sure he's done some better ones now but it was yeah. really good that one was good yeah uh, he came from nowhere to when the race taking it off Charles Leclerc on like the last lap or something like that why was he in no man's land nowhere because he stalled off the start the red bull has a really hard time doing that and yeah. i think it was also visible in the alpha tauri from 2018 or sorry the terrasse from 2018 because they were trialing the honda engines for the red mm -hmm. bull family as well and the similar issue is there so yeah uh i'm sure by now they'll have fine tuned it but that is something i've definitely noticed yeah i mean it makes me think actually like obviously you gave max as your example but you know those two drivers on the team um it reminds me of actually Alex Albon Mugello 2020 
we did see a lot of like restart issues because I think there were what three starts that race. I think there was I think there was a different issue for that because what right. I'm referring to is just when you are coming from a standstill. So mm -hmm. only when lights out and away we go. Safety car restarts. No, but they did No, like no, no. It was actually start, lights right? out and away we go. No, actual. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I remember in like, safety car restart, but but specifically, I remember Max yeah. was actually having some issue with the engine in the low end of the RPM. It wouldn't pick up, and I I can't know what that is. Aside from speculating that it might be something relating to the MGU-H, because that is something historically the Honda has had a lot of trouble with, especially in the Alonso days. That was the thing that kept kept failing, so they had to run a huge turbocharger to offset it, and then that would cause the further issues down the line, which would make the engine break, and then they'd say, <laughs> okay, no, we can't break the engine, let's just turn it down, and there's like, GP2 engine, GP2, uh, <laughs> like, all of that was caused by... Yeah basically not having a good MGUH. So yeah. that the MGUH also is one of the main suppliers of low end power at the like uh, lower down ends of the RPM. So that could be something but um what were you saying about Alex Albon? I actually don't remember how he started yeah, that race. Yeah, so he Mugello, it. I think he was starting P4. He had a bad start kind of. Well, Max had the worst start there actually. Mm. If you remember he really stalled I it do, and ended yeah. up That's like, what I was talking about. He, yeah. he could barely like get yeah. going. Again, probably no fault, lol. No fault of his own, just the engine, just the way it's built. He ended up towards the back of the pack. Everyone just drove past him. He ended up getting involved in the big collision that went on um, on lap one. Um, so that was Max out of it. So it just left Alex for Red Bull. They did have to do a, re a full restart. I don't know. I'm pretty sure there were two red flags at Mugello. If you remember, it was a very chaotic yes, I believe race. I believe there were, but from what I recall, they were both rolling starts, not standing starts. I seem to starts. think they were standing starts. And I remember because there was one rolling start, which was okay, and then the other one had the carnage. Mm. Um, yeah, no, that one had the, the carnage. I think there was a red flag after that, though. I think. Yes, there would have been. But I have seem been. to remember every time there was a restart, I was so worried for Alex because he just kept mm. losing positions every restart. Yeah. I was like, stop, <laughs> make it stop. <laughs> like, I'm an Alex Albon fan, as we all know. Um, you know, I was rooting for my Very guy. Well documented, fact. Yeah. <laughs> Very well documented. Yeah, I've got my Williams Racing t shirt on today. Um, so, actually, let's talk about Alex um, just before. Yeah. So he he got P10 today, which yeah, was he drove really well. Point, he drove really well. yay! <laughs> we got we got point, guys. The I was actually really impressed with how he was driving. To be honest, I I, I as I said earlier, he was one of the four I had on the onboard. Yeah, he had a pretty decent. From what I recall, obviously it's like almost at the beginning of the race now, like three hours ago, as mm -hmm. as of the time of recording this. Yeah, um, but he from what I recall, he had a really decent battle with Piastri, and he even managed to overtake Lando later on in the race. Yeah. So honestly, okay. It also indicates how bad the McLaren is this year, but like the fact that he's up there fighting mm -hmm. for the fringes of the points and, and fact, defending as well, as well, like he held and that. defending as well because he had Sonoda he gaining was on him. Almost, yeah. he was almost side by side with Yuki as yeah. he came across the line, and he was so, so it, cool was under pressure. Close. So he really kept it all together. So that, that was honestly, I would say, a really good drive from Alex. Yeah, yay! Um, Let's go. Yeah. I mean, yeah, as, as a Williams enjoyer, that was a pretty satisfying race in general. I think coming from preseason testing, we did not expect a lot from Williams. You know, they were kind of generally the bottom yeah. team. I think most of the like Sky Sports pundits had all put them like basically 10th or maybe 9th in the yeah. estimations. But, you know, I Alex think from got... What, what, I think from what Alex said after the race, even they put themselves <laughs> around 10th. <laughs> You know, and that's fair game. enough, you know. It's it's not yeah. a surprise for them to be at the bottom or at the back of the yeah. pack. Um, Bu building teams up like that takes a long time. Yeah, so, uh, but they are I getting there. Before we before we before I forget, yeah. I think a great example of that of how long it takes to build a team up. Two great examples, because one in the positive direction and one in the downwards direction is <laughs> in terms of car development. It's such a long term project to develop a, a, a like an especially a new car as we had in 2022, completely new set of rules, right? So they were kind of starting from scratch. Yeah. So I think it's really interesting to see how how much impact uh, Sebastian Vettel had on how good the uh, Aston Martin is now. Like yeah. the, one of his key strengths as like Christian Horner used to like go on and on about how good he was in this field was the technical feedback and the debriefs. Um, the, the, the old story goes, streets say, that um, Mark Webber would be finished debriefing his whole race, whereas Seb would still be on the formation lap working through all of that. <laughs> so he 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 went in detail with everything. So yeah, especially with all of the new stuff and the new facilities coming through, having a mind a technical mind like Seb on the job 
uh, to develop this car has clearly been a huge uh, benefit for them and it's good to see uh, even though seb has en- ended up retiring unfortunately he's happy and i'm glad that they are able to reap the benefits of that um yeah. i think an interesting uh, case study would be in the other direction as well with mclaren because they yes. were struggling so much with trying to adapt the car to daniel and to teach him how to or not to teach him but to sort of change subtle things about the car to fit his driving style better because it's a very unique car in terms of how it just pushes on it understeers like crazy on the brakes which is the opposite to what daniel yeah. likes unfortunately for him um they spent so long focusing on that that they didn't really even have anything left to show for progression right. into this year um i think it's interesting of course so there's do you think way more that it's potentially that, but... Daniel Ricardo that's caused this lapse that's, in performance. I I I don't want that makes it sound super like it does. It does. I, I don't yeah. Wanna, <laughs> I, I I don't want to say it like that because yeah. it's not it's not like a shot at him. You know what I mean? It's no, like yeah. he comes in. He came into a team where the car is fundamentally opposite to what They, his brain is. It's on them for not building the car to suit him as a driver. No, I mean, I yes <laughs> yes, but they have had this car concept. being that that yeah. mentality like you can see those same characteristics over the course of the past like four rule changes since like even back when alonso was there um so th- this is like a pretty standard mclaren affair and in fact even super interestingly that aspect of just absolutely having no turning when you're even breathing on the brake pedal it even extends to their gt cars like the mclaren 720s gt3 it has that same aspect where uh, if you compare it to the ferrari um ferrari 488 gt3 you have to like really trail off the brakes gradually and you can even carry like 1 2% braking um into the corner to like get the weight on the fr- front end that help you turn in whereas on the mclaren if you have even like 1% brake pressure it just does not want to turn like it, it 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 is a completely different experience and i think that's so interesting how the like you know how they say the suspension research that they do in formula 1 the, all of the research and development they do in formula 1 all trickles down to the lower categories of racing and then into the road cars as well yeah to see that being even reflected in in their gt cars in their sports cars as our fun fans like to call them um i find that super interesting personally but in terms of whether it's his fault or not i think it's just an unfortunate it's unlucky i think it's just unlucky because he he ended up coming into a team which looked promising but the car was just so opposite to him and he's got 20 like 20 plus years of racing experience building up that driving style mclaren has like I can't I don't know exactly the number but X number of years developing that that car into that direction with that like logic of developing yeah. a suspension system and a chassis and all that kind of stuff and now they are directly opposite to each other so now they're spending all the whole time trying to get these both on the same page yeah that is not going forward anymore so it's not his fault it's not McLaren's mm-hmm. fault yeah. it's not Daniel Ricciardo's fault it's just a really unlucky set of circumstances yeah um yeah, which I think that makes I guess sense just happens in sports sometimes yeah I think that's a really fair way to look at it as well. Like sometimes it's just not meant to be. <laughs> like yeah. it just doesn't As as like a uh, weird as that sounds as like leaving it up to fate and you have no agency as that sounds. It is just it do just be like that at times. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go back to lap 1 cuz I got very the, distracted oh there. <laughs> yeah. I forgot we were no. still on lap 1. <laughs> <clears throat> This is a certified Sebastian Vettel <laughs> debrief. Let's go. On. Um yeah, so we had Max got a good start. Um yes. Perez potentially suffered a bit at the hands of the Red Bull starting system. Um Yes. But also I, I mean uh, dirty side dirty side. Yeah. Off the racing line side of the grid. Yeah. It happens sometimes. Yeah. So that picture. to me watching lights out that was the first thing that caught my eye Checo kind of bit of a don't, slow guys, start. Also, don't worry about me looking down right now. I've got the <laughs> I've got the race start on my phone. I'm rewatching <laughs> it so I can just make sure that I'm everything. <laughs> Um yeah and then Shal directly behind Max he got a pretty good start um and he kind of almost shoots past Checo almost instantly yeah, almost, like he just almost. just takes him like on Checo's on board you can just see Shal just appear um just, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, on Shal's on board it's like uh it's almost like he it, it almost feels like he started earlier than the others obviously yeah. he didn't but yeah. like it feels but like he was that, just so it was like, that much yeah, of a, he an was advantage on it Um, In fact, then, um, another thing is Carlos almost got pushed all the way into yes, the pit lane. Yes, that was going to be my start. next thing. So you know, yeah. Charles and Checo are kind of duking it out, and as mm-hmm. they're both kind of drifting towards the pit lane, Carlos also got a good start, and obviously Checo didn't. Um, so Carlos is gaining ground on Checo pretty quick, but there's just nowhere for him to go, which is a shame because he could have done really well um, had he got 
found a gap. But yeah, yes. he basically I was I was watching it like, oh my though, goodness. If you look if you look at what happened to Carlos. Yes. Because of that. So he gets uh, and I'm narrating it because I can't show it for copyright yeah, reasons, fine. obviously. But he gets the start. <laughs> Checo gets a horrible start compared to the other two. Checo ends up accidentally pushing Carlos off a little bit, but that gives Carlos the opportunity to come around the outside of Checo and slot in right behind Charles. But as a result of that, Checo doesn't have as much track to use on the left hand side. Uh, as it opens up from turn two to turn three, so he couldn't actually, even if he was, even if he had the grip to do, which I'm not entirely convinced of, he wouldn't have been able to use that space against Charles. So, at, because this is all happening within two three seconds, it's yeah. obviously pure instinct from them. Yeah. But it's so in, good to see how like tuned in they are to the teamwork. It, it is. It is. This is the kind of subtle thing. Usually in F1, when they talk about oh the teamwork, they mean like. Fernando is faster than you. Do you understand <laughs> the message? And then he gets out of the yeah. way. Yeah. In reality, there's a bunch of subtle things like that. Carlos being on this side of Checo rather than that side of Checo completely changed. It completely ruined Checo's opportunity to go ahead and attack Shell yeah. into turn three. Um, which, like I said, it doesn't matter whether he had the grip or not. He literally could not have gone there because yeah. Carlos is in the way. Yeah. That that is something I find super interesting. Yeah, and it's really interesting as well. Like. The awareness that a driver has going into that first corner of just knowing where all the other cars are positioned and being able to utilize that, like that, that is, you know, I wouldn't have that's even where considered the skill that. Of <laughs> like is, that's yeah. so cool. Another thing is even still on Carlos's onboard on the way down to turn four, um, that uh, sort of uphill, sort of downhill on certain parts of the track, that right hander. <clears throat> One thing that Carlos did was because Checo was trying to really stick to the inside. To maybe capitalize on Charles going a bit wide on the exit, Carlos decided to stick his nose in on the outside, which means Checo is then again boxed in. He couldn't go. <laughs> he couldn't. He couldn't take advantage of the fact that Charles did not go wide. We love that and from like Carlos. go around to the outside. Carlos is there, and obviously he's going there partially for his own his own yeah. self because that's how. No, you exactly. Because I think he was if trying to like inside, slip to in outside. behind yeah, Charles. Yeah, in, in case yeah. there's a mistake. Yeah. But how well it works out for Ferrari as a whole, it's very yeah. interesting to see. Yeah, I mean, so great, great start from Ferrari, really. Pretty textbook, I'd say. Like, I don't think they could have as done much gets, better. Really. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. It's kind of different stories for Red Bull with Max just sailing away into the distance and Checo yeah, kind of but still not fighting. Too bad. Not <laughs> yeah. Too bad. The um, fact that Checo only lost one position off yeah. like, such a bad start, yeah, like, exactly. Lunch wise, mm -hmm. really not bad. Honestly, he can he can be uh, satisfied with that. Yeah. Okay. Red so Bull, Red Bull can, as a whole, he will yeah. probably be annoyed, obviously, mm -hmm. but Red Bull can be satisfied with that yeah. as a whole. So moving on to Mercedes and Aston Martin behind. Now, these guys were a bit harder for me to follow. I think it's just because I'm not used to how the Mercedes looks and they all look a bit similar at being quite dark Especially cars. In the, at the night time, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not as familiar of what went on here. I do know Lewis got past George at some point. I think Lewis got past Alonso as well. Do not worry. I am re-watching it again. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll just talk while you re-watch So yeah, Lewis, Lewis got oh, okay. an okay lunch. He got a better yeah. lunch than everyone on his row and behind, but Alonso got a really good start. Charles and Carlos got a really good start. They all just disappeared. And Checo was already starting so far in front that they yeah. just like were specks in the distance. This is him before he's even reached turn one. This is Lewis. <laughs> and look how far away everyone else is. They're, and if you think about away. how close like Charles, Checo and Carlos all were, yeah, yeah, like yeah. that's a huge Charles and, gap. Charles yeah. and Checo were literally like this far apart. Yeah, they were front, basically front wheel to, to wheel, you know? <clears throat> yeah. And then Lewis uh, approaches into turn one, manages to actually find some space down the inside of uh, Alonso, not being able to make that move stick, but he used that to defend from any potential attackers behind. Yeah. Then into turn four, when all of this action is happening between Checo and um, Sainz, um, Hamilton managed to find a gap on the inside of Alonso. I think Alonso was also interesting, uh, like interested in what was going on ahead with the two Ferraris on the Red Bull. Um, and he didn't realize how much of an overspeed Lewis Hamilton had. Honestly, in his defense, I don't think there's much he could have done with that mm -hmm. either way, because Lewis just had such a strong exit and yeah. then the slipstream. So it was kind of a done deal, but Lewis ended up in uh, fifth place uh, yeah. on the exit of turn five. And then obviously we had a little bit of an incident between the two Aston Martins. Um, so Indeed. on the replay, we did see, um, well, ma mainly it was brought to light on the replay, but we saw Stroll kind of come into the corner with quite a lot of speed and he, oh, he almost used Alonso to slow him down um, <laughs> when he got there. Um, so what were your thoughts on that? It wasn't actually that bad, to be honest. Like, um, I, I know for a fact everyone is going to be jumping down Stroll's throat for this one. Like, he's the worst teammate ever, just because he's Alonso's teammate. Yeah. Um, they did the same with Esteban. 
naturally. They did the same with Stuffel so badly. His troll generally gets a lot of hate as well. <clears throat> yeah, like. for sure. Um, but the way I see it is also something that Mike Crack, Mike Crack agreed to uh, <laughs> after the race in the interview. The way it happened was because Lance was trying really hard to outbreak George on his outside, uh, he steamed in with a lot of speed. And the line that Fernando was taking made it really look like he was taking a wider line to like leave a little bit of a gap on the inside there. Um, so Lance, yes, he came in way too hard in the corner. But he was like, okay, there's a little bit of space here I can insert myself into. Yeah. Ha ha ha, insert Would myself. you call that can, leaving the door open? No. Um, Why are we laughing? Okay, you know what? I'm not going to Insert, ask. Insert euphemism. Ha ha ha, funny. Uh, anyway. Anyway. Guys, <laughs> okay. Anyway. <laughs> But the, the I wouldn't call that leaving the door open because he wasn't trying to enter that door. Right. He was just trying to stay ahead of George, and right. he went he he went in a little bit a little bit hot on the brakes. Yeah. And that's that's okay. Yeah. It just so happened that Alonso decided to cut back in and managed to take a later apex, um, which look, from if you see Lance's on board, it did look a bit unexpected. In yeah. reality, it isn't. But it's just one of those things that happens on lap one. I wouldn't say this is like a yeah. teammate rivalry. Oh my god, no, of heating course, up in yeah. The Aston Martin garage. It could have been any two drivers. <laughs> yeah. It just so happened that they were both they were both the green ones, you know? Yeah. Like if you actually yeah. rewatch the contact, it was so unbelievably yeah. minor. And it literally didn't impact either of them in the slightest. The, the, their pace was not changed at all from that. So like Mike Crack said himself, it's just one of those things, it's not a big deal. Sorry. So no, it's okay. <laughs> so to me as a viewer, and I was just watching it well, re-watching the start with my family, and they kind of felt like and I feel like the commentators had the same thought that perhaps Alonso lost the place to Lewis because of Lance Stroll or would you say it was inevitable that he was losing it anyway let me actually take a look at it again because I'm not entirely sure that's the case just while just while Neil's looking I will explain Neil is like an expert at collisions so whenever there's any sort of contact going on I'm like Neil whose fault was that and he knows no and, no okay yeah. so now I can confirm okay that move from Hamilton was done and dusted way before Stroll was even near the incident okay I understand why they would think that because yeah. by the time they they were both side by side then Hamilton gets it I mean uh, then Alonso gets the tap and he's squirming around like that yeah. trying to save the car and Lewis goes past but in reality, when Lewis has such an immense overspeed on, out of the last corner, there's absolutely no chance that Fernando would have kept that position under any circumstance unless right. Lewis just forgot to press the throttle. <laughs> and, so that's and that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. Is Lewis Hamilton. Yeah. It's not happening. So cool. I, I would not say that at all, no. Okay. And I guess those eight were kind of the main eight from this the first lap are there any other main characters on that lap that you wanted to highlight um i know you mentioned albon and piastri that was a bit later on in the race okay. like after things had started to like settle yeah. into a i'm thing. a bad album fan i didn't watch him on lap one <laughs> that's there was just a sea you, of cars you, i couldn't you see you don't have f1 tv in the uk now <laughs> I it's don't. only launched in india just now yeah. I'm on my seven day free trial so i'm making the most of it at the moment as you should um, <laughs> but to be honest uh i someone who i didn't notice at all the entire race only on the last lap did I see where he ended up was Gasly. He started in last, literally 20th yeah. place. And he somehow ended up in ninth uh, with so the second he, fastest lap. He, in he, fact, he had the fastest lap until the last lap. Where did he manage to him. gain a lot on the opening lap? Okay, it's lights out and away we go. Uh, Gasly gets a pretty good start. He's fully alongside with uh, Nick DeVries, uh, I think it is, in the Afetari on the left. Uh, breaking into turn one, there's kind of a wall ahead of him. There's not really a gigantic amount he can do. The space opens up in front of Magnussen. But again, Magnussen gets a decent uh, exit out of turn three. Not a gigantic amount he can do. He has to slot back in there in second to last in P19. Now there's a bunch of battles going on ahead. He's taking to the outside for turn four. Decides to cut to the apex. Overtakes two cars on the exit. Unfortunately, Piastri does get a decent uh, run on the way out. So he doesn't... He in fact loses it on the way back into turn six. Now he's side by side with Bottas, uh, or Joe, sorry, uh, into turn seven, loses that position. Now breaking down for the hairpin at turn eight. Um, everyone's in a pack right now. He's fully like in a, in a whole like uh, bunch here. Now down into turn 10, the super difficult downhill blind left hander takes a wider line than the uh, cars ahead. I assume he's going to get a better exit. I assume wrong. I actually don't know what I'm reacting to here. There's, the, he doesn't make up anything on lap one. <laughs> Shall so we just cut I this out? It, I find it... No, it's okay. We can keep it in because I, it's really interesting to see such a hectic first lap and have it literally result in nothing. Only to 57 laps later, see him up uh, 11 places. Like, that's, that's where, where did he come from? Where did... Where, who, who let him go? <laughs> where did he go? <laughs> 
Ja. Cotton, Cotton Eye. Uh, Cotton Eye Gasly. Uh, couldn't make up a joke on that one. I, I am so sorry, guys. I really let the team down today. The the Neil Bursi joking department. It's really, it's really lacking. We need to go back over the winter and really uh, get us a new car for yeah. next year. Some um, factory okay, upgrades. So <laughs> even on lap two, uh, at least in lap two sector one, not really making any progress. He overtook Hulkenberg on lap two um, uh, in like turn three. I'm thinking <clears> actually, <throat> Gasly was one of the early pitters, wasn't he? Oh, he pitted yes, like he been, before actually. the pit window opened, didn't he? Like the let me let me just recommended. Yeah, that's fine. I don't know when the recommended one was, yeah. but I will let you know. Because no, I remember the commentators saying like, "This is the the pit window's open now," like, which is basically saying like, "This is the optimal time to pit." And I was thinking, oh, yeah. Gasly pitted before that. Um, yes. Okay. So, so Gasly well... actually pitted on lap eight. Right. So he was in on lap eight, and his next lap. I think Wait, everyone what? else was pitting around lap thirteen. Seems I context. don't have I don't have data on what his lap times were on oh lap nine, goodness. ten, eleven, and twelve. Well, we're going to assume a strategy helped him out. Probably. It probably, because he was on softs on lap 8, and then the next time I see him, he's on hard. So that right. is around when he pittered. Um, which is... It is interesting. Yeah. Very early. Very, very early. Um, the soft tires hadn't really lost much pace, but he got onto the hards <laughs> so early, and that the pace didn't really ever drop off. In fact, he went super quick as the field started to come off on the hards. Only to on lap thirty nine switch back to softs, and then crank out some insane laps. In fact, he set a one thirty five zero, which at the time was the fastest lap of the race until the final lap when Jure took it off him, uh, and then doing really strong laps one thirty five one thirty five one thirty six one thirty six, and then as the tire wear started to come in, he went into the high thirty sixes and thirty sevens until the checkered flag. So really, really quick driving from him uh, overall to make yeah. that strategy work. So we saw in qualifying. Um, at Alpine, there was quite a different story for the two drivers, you know. Um, there was, yeah. Ocon, Definitely. very good result, while Gasly was very, very um, disappointed with his. Yeah. And then we yeah. almost saw the opposite in the race. So we had yeah. Gasly, obviously, a very successful drive, very good recovery drive, you know, overtaking very, very and stayed out honestly, of trouble. Honestly, if, if not for Fernando having such a banger race, mm -hmm. I would honestly lean towards Gasly being driver of the day. Um, and a close second would be Lance, aside from Fernando. What about Albon? Um, yeah, he was good. I mean, I, it wasn't like <laughs> like astounding. Like, yeah. I mean, he, no. he kind of drove his race and it ended up yeah. in a decent location, yeah. in, a, in a decent result. <laughs> yeah, obviously, Gasly had a very successful drive while we saw Esteban Ocon kind of have a bit of a, a different yeah. story. So Not from, a good day for him, From about lap, I want to say about lap 16, he got a warning or it was sort of... it was game over from him. I mean, not game over, but the beginning of the end. Let's say yeah was before the lights are even happened. Yes, he stopped like about half a not even half a meter, like maybe twenty or thirty centimeters too far to the right. Yeah, um, which means he's out of his grid box. Which means that's yeah, a penalty, it's not allowed. Yeah, and it's like a slam dunk basically. When the message slam, it's, popped it's up on very, the screen, I was like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. there we go. <laughs> no, uh, uh, during the race, the message they showed was. Start procedure infringement, which I didn't really know what they were talking about because I wasn't paying attention to yeah. Esteban, unfortunately. <laughs> but <clears throat> when they showed us the replay, it was clear cut. That, I mean, he was not in it, unfortunately. Yeah. But what is even more unfortunate is the fact that when he came in to serve the penalty, the way he served it, they were planning to serve it, was come into the pit stop, stop, as in serve the penalty for five seconds, do nothing on the car for five seconds, then do the. Change the wing, pit stop, or change the tires, change the wing, whatever. Front wing damage then as well. Go. Yeah. Unfortunately, as it turns out for them, one of the Alpine mechanics jumped in. Instead of waiting five seconds, he only ended up waiting 4.6 seconds. So that... So how does that happen as a mechanic? How do you accidentally That's a very good go question. Early? I don't know the answer. I because I don't know either. <laughs> yeah, because generally, whenever you see footage of these kinds of penalties being served, they in fact wait even like six and a half seconds just yeah. in case. So I've actually never seen um, in F1 one of the mechanics jumping the gun and going a bit yeah. too early and honestly i feel i really feel for that mechanic yeah. I, I, they are definitely yeah. gonna be so sad from this and i hope the team doesn't like beat them up about it too much you know yeah, what i mean no. and they don't beat i mean mistakes happen i know i know it's yeah. f1 it's a cutthroat it's, world it's literally but... four tenths of mistakes yeah. so in my perspective the way i see it like everyone in the team is pushing to save every last tenth 
the drivers, the the mechanics, literally everyone. We even saw the like Esteban Ocon, like you know, like, yeah. even on the grid, he was pushing to get every last millimeter yeah. of that grid slot literally. and accidentally overcooked it a little. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just it's just one of those things yeah. that happen and when yeah. you're pushing the limits, you sometimes... So Alpine, if you're watching, be nice to we the mechanics. It's okay. We love it's the okay. mechanics. <laughs> These things happen. But yeah. yeah, I mean, at that point, he gets another penalty for that. Uh, because technically this penalty wasn't served. Yeah. So he gets five seconds and then another and five it, seconds for doing he, it wrong, I think. Get, yeah, yeah. And then when he came in to serve that one, he sped in the pits by 0.1 of a KPH. So that gives him so, another one on top of that. <laughs> so he's a master total of 20 seconds worth of penalty at this point. Oh, uh, 15. I think 15. Cause, 20, because uh, it was five, five. Then... Five, 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 no? Five, then ten, then five. Oh, no, no, no. Okay, so he didn't get another penalty for the first problem. He just needed to serve the first one because he didn't do it correctly. Yeah, but he had to serve so it twice, right? It, so, it, no, no, no. five so seconds. It, he, he, yeah. He, in terms of official listing, he had 15 seconds of penalties. In practice, it was 19.6 seconds of penalties. Ah, yeah, I'm with you now. I'm with you now. Yeah. yeah. The first so time he, when they waited those four yeah. and a half seconds, it wasn't counted as serving the penalty. Right. Even though, like, most of it was served. Yeah. Um, which is why I'm, he had to come in again. And I'm with you now. That, that, that really cooked problems. my brain for a second. Yes, I was it like, could, It what? clearly cooked Alpine's brain as well, unfortunately, yeah. for them. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, no, a day um, to forget for Esteban. Yeah, I do want to highlight, know. actually, just before we move on from Esteban, um, in the end, the guy just gave up, I assume, <laughs> just falls into yeah, no, the that garage. Literally, that literally was, is what they did, because like, like we were talking about earlier, it's a very long season, and they only got like three engines yeah. and three of the other components and stuff. They did not want to waste it. Yeah. Uh, this is this is not something they figured that would be worth the risk of like yeah. wearing out engine so parts far and back taking at their penalties point, later yeah. on. At this point, park it, call it a day. It's okay. Yeah. We'll we'll fight another day. It's fine. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, the opposite uh, approach to what McLaren did with Lando. Yeah, I was just about um, to bring that up actually. So they, they why, just kept did, going. why did I, they keep I don't, going? I don't know. I did they know. treat it as some sort of test session? That was my assumption, and it still that's is. That's what I was but thinking. Honestly, as well. I haven't heard anything from them about it, so I don't. Yeah. know, maybe, probably. They'd probably it's a similar say thing to what Hauger was doing actually this this afternoon in oh, afternoon by my time and yeah. and Bahrain time actually. Yeah. Um, in, in the Formula F2 two. feature race, yes, he was about six laps down after like a yeah. couple of incidents and a penalty or two or something like that. But they yeah. kept driving around because yeah. every single lap you do, especially that early in your racing career, every single lap is a huge amount of information that you yeah. just you need it. <laughs> And if you you have a working car, do the laps. <laughs> it's it's fine, and yeah. that makes sense. But I guess in Esteban's case, it also does make sense to yeah. save the engine for later. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. So he came on the radio actually as well. We we saw it as he was going into the garage, um, and he basically said, "I've done this through my whole career. Why am I being penalized now?" Do you think that's true, or is he perhaps just? I think I don't think he realized what the problem was because of. Because when you're sitting like that low in the car, yeah, you, you like seeing you you missed it by like ten centimeters is a bit difficult to do. Yeah, um, you can see the front edge of the front wheel, so you can see you haven't gone too far forward, but seeing you're too far to the side, almost impossible to do, especially because once you're in that position, you can't get back out of that position until right. the race starts. So yeah. You're stuck there, right? So even if he noticed, oh, all of the cars in front of me are aligned this way, and I'm like aligned that way, he can't do anything about well, it. Yeah, you what, can't just I, jump out. That's and... why I think he was so confused about um like what what do you mean this is a normal start yeah. i've been doing it every and obviously time his eyes are on the lights the he's making yeah. sure and he's i mean ready his eyes go. cannot he's... be on that part of the car yeah. because there's a whole like headrest on the wall and yeah. all that there's, he can't see that so he i don't my theory is he didn't realize yeah uh, and you knew got and, and it's not like he was trying to cheat as well just to be clear yeah, like... for sure no. he we really would not have gained no, anything exactly from this. But the thing is you have to draw the line somewhere yeah and the fia is drawing the line in white paint on the tarmac yes so quite literally drawing the line. The line. <laughs> unfortunately it is what it is yes that kind of thing yeah so then regarding his other incidents obviously with the mechanics um accidentally starting a bit too early to do work on his car that's not his fault speeding in the pit lane i guess it was just such a minimal amount that he was over i guess yeah. by that point he was just not that he was getting careless but he was probably just like oh come on do i have to go through it's the almost again? yeah when when you're in that position i've been in that position in in uh, e esports and similar thing unfortunately right. <clears throat> where i get one one pit stop and i have to do another pit stop with the penalty mm. and then i speed in the pit lane and that at that point in fact, another even uh, Felipe Drogovic in Monaco last year, he had a similar thing. You just the frustration starts building I up. It's like I'm that. losing so much yeah. time. I cannot afford to lose any more time. Yeah. So I'm gonna push the braking for the pit lane right to the limit, and he pushed it right to the limit and a little bit more. Yeah. So 
it, and again it, it, it wasn't yeah. deliberate from him like it's just what happens sometimes again when you're trying to get the limit and i think we just saw a lot of that from alpine today i mean it shows they're all really yeah. trying to get the most out of that car which is you know it's yeah. what you want to see in a team you don't want to see anyone... i think it's super encouraging actually uh for the regulations of the sport as a whole it's so close now everything is yeah. so good pierre only messed up like one lap he yeah. got track limits on one and just had a slightly dirty lap on the second one. He was last. Yeah. Like currently, what's really cool to see is in this race at least, there wasn't a single back marker team. Even McLaren were in yeah. there. With and Alpha Tauri, who had, you know, they weren't really anywhere this weekend. They still had they you were know, up there Snowder in chasing yeah. Albon down to the line for that last point. It, it really could have currently been. Currently, there's only. Top runners and midfield. There's no back markers right now, which, which I think is, is so super, exciting. It's super interesting because I've never seen that kind of dynamic yeah. play out in F1 before. And it's what we want to see as well. We don't. It, there's no definitely, excitement yeah. in seeing, you know, if you think back to maybe 2021 Williams. Haas, yeah. Yeah. Haas as well. Haas. 20, it was. It, yeah. And it and it's even more frustrating, <clears throat> especially for external viewers, because it's like, especially from inside the car. You can be driving the lap of your life, absolute hero, and you're four seconds off the off the pole position. And no one cares. Yeah. And no one cares. They don't even notice. Like, oh, he beat his teammate again. I guess. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know. I mean, whatever. <laughs> like, it's it's unfortunate when you're in that. It's position. great that I, everyone I, has I really the opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Like even even Logan Sargent, a rookie, his debut Honestly, qualifying. He did, he did really well. He did really, so really well. So close. I mean, two two different ways. He was so <laughs> close to getting free to Q two. Um, he got equal time with Lando. Could have very easily if he'd set that lap before Lando could have gone into Q2. And then there was Albon as well, his teammate, literally millimetres away yeah. from track limits and having the lap yeah. um, disqualified. But I guess that's what quality is all about. Yeah, about that's the thing. <laughs> he but, paid for the track um, and he's going to use it. <laughs> or he didn't said, in the history. Comparing the junior careers of uh, Logan and Oscar Piastri. In fact, in F3, they were even teammates at Prima, both championship contenders oh. until the final round didn't of Didn't know that. <laughs> I, I'm I'm an OG Prema fan. I am OG Prema YouTube channel fan. I love you, Prema YouTube. I love you so much, Prema, Prema YouTube. YouTube. <laughs> but uh, they literally, th- I would say they're almost exactly equal, but PS3 was a little bit better, like a tiny bit better every time mm-hmm. um, that he was like, and I'm talking like fractions of a tenth here that all yeah. add up over a season that yeah. Oscar won the championship and Logan didn't. Basically, Logan got punted off in the Mugello specific race, but then it, it's all about the whole season, right? So yeah. Um, that kind of thing. So the fact that Oscar had such a nightmare, especially with just getting the car to work, um, whereas yeah. Logan was like, he seemed on top of things, you know, it, it seemed like the only problem for him was just like inexperience in the sense of like the yeah. the mental aspect of like, okay, I'm in a Grand Prix right now. Like I'm yeah. fully racing with I F1 kept, drivers and I an F1 car right I kept thinking that now. for the rookies. Like I was really having yeah. empathy for them. I was like, how do they feel right yeah. now knowing like... As, as someone who is... And it's nowhere near the step that these guys are making. But I stepped recently from uh, like four stroke carts to two stroke carts. And the... Would just you the mind level explaining of, what that means for our viewers? Um, it's, a, it's a bit complicated. It's like okay. a rental cart versus race cart. That's okay. all you need to know. Yeah. Um, but what the important part is the engine sound is so loud on the two stroke carts that <laughs> like I was like shocked because like I, it was a 35 car race on my first race start in this category. And it's like everything was so loud and so overwhelming and so different to what anything I'd done before that like. I, I even forgot the rules for the race start. Like, I, I had a rocket ship start, and then I, I was like, wait, wait, I can't do that. I had to back up, and I I ended up having a net zero start instead because I, I I was so, like, lost in the moment that I forgot that you can't do a particular thing in the start procedure. And luckily, I got away with it without a penalty, but, like, I can really empathize with what Logan and uh, Oscar, to a lesser extent, because he's been hanging around the paddock so long and just watching yeah. the races and doing nothing else. It feels like Sergeant almost popped out of Sergeant, nowhere slightly. Especially. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, especially with how he's been... I mean, he was driving like a shows racing uh, a couple of years ago in F2, right? <laughs> so, I mean, he's, he's, he's been having a hard time in terms of uh, luck in his junior career, uh, especially after Prema F3 when he lost the championship to Oscar. Uh, he had to shift to uh, F2 in like a really slow car, and I think he even had to set out racing one of those years. Don't quote me on that, sorry. I'm, I just yeah. don't know what this is about. It's okay. It, it, it doesn't really matter. The point yeah. is, F2 <laughs> to F1 is a huge jump. Like, it's not even close. So, the fact that he coped with that so well and was just kind of driving a normal race by his own standards, um, which is a very high standard. It's super impressive, honestly. Yeah. Hooray. Good for Logan. Love you, Logan (laughs) Sergeant. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, arguably, I mean, literally by the stats, he was the best performing rookie of the three. 
Um, we've mentioned Piastri as well briefly. There wasn't really a lot to yeah. say about. I mean, there's Paul not much. Well, I think it's just it was it was funny to see the like, like I said earlier about the steering wheel. You can see what the screen yeah. says when he was on the pit. He was like switching the car off and on again. I mean, it was like, <laughs> it, was like it was like seeing someone who like accidentally changed the setting on their PC and he's he can't get it to switch back on. It <laughs> like, what do it I do? Exactly like that. Like it was like oh, I mean it turned it off and on no that didn't work uh, let's do it again oh no that didn't, that didn't work either oh, now, uh, it, now one, it's one just stuck on the Windows logo uh, never mind like you could literally see the McLaren logo on update the screen. installing he it all the way off and then all the way back on again like it was and it still didn't work so yeah I mean it's unfortunate but like uh, yeah I guess it's better to have a failure like when you're already back in the pits than when you're like nine yeah. million miles away from the pit lane and then yeah, having to do exactly. that gigantic walk of shame back scooter yeah. ride of shame back to the pit lane and i guess just since we've discussed two of the rookies let's just briefly touch on de Vries. we didn't really yeah. hear a lot from him this race he was pretty a bit much unevent- a, uneventful he wasn't yeah, really a, a main character yeah. let's say he was, he was just... not yeah it was a bit uneventful from nick de Vries, but yeah um i think for him it, uh, there's plenty of information he can uh, he can yeah. take out because he did a whole grumpy distance in an f1 yeah. car so that's a lot of useful information to learn yeah um so yeah, I mean, not a gigantic amount of opportunities that were given to him, not a gigantic amount he did in the race, but whatever he did do is really solid uh, for building a foundation for m- yeah. more F1 races so, to come. So positive, lots of positives you can take from that. Then. Lots of positives for sure, yeah. So with it being a new season, at the cool down room, we've decided to give awards every race weekend. Um, so first up, we have Driver of the Day. Which is a pretty self-explanatory award. Obviously, there's a fan-voted one who I believe was Fernando Alonso. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So Neil, I'll let you go first. Who was your personal driver of the day? So yeah, of course, Fernando Alonso, amazing. Like, yeah. Th- I don't think anyone is. Even the fans, obviously, they. Yeah. Majority agrees. However, I would like to also shine an honourable mention. Let's say, if we suppose Fernando Alonso is not n- not the driver of the day, yeah. Then I would also like to point out Lance Stroll. Uh, he. Honestly, if I, I've got his lap chart up here, and he was, he was on the pace, and this is someone who couldn't walk like three, like uh, two weeks, like ago. five or six, da- five or six days ago. Yeah, he he had his crash like two weeks ago, but he, yeah. he couldn't even walk like five or six days ago, and now he's out here like on on the pace with Fernando Alonso. Like yeah. that's good. He, he that drove good. really well. Um, like he um, <clears throat> Alonso, I think overall on the race, the, the way the race panned out as a whole, obviously he was ahead. But in terms of just raw lap times, they were pretty comparable throughout. Um, best lap wise, Alonso was four times faster, but he also had uh, two DRSs rather than Stroll only having one DRS on that lap. Um, analyzing the data a little bit, aside from the DRS spots, um, honestly, Lance only started losing out towards the. Yeah, it, if you look at this delta variance line, so yeah, so as you can see here on this line called delta in seconds. Um, what this the flat line is Alonso's lap, and the white line, as in the flat green line, is Alonso's lap, and the white line is Stroll's delta in uh, that is to say the difference in lap time between Stroll's lap and Alonso's lap. So if in as you can see here in uh, turn one, um, Stroll's delta goes down underneath the green line, that means he's quicker than Alonso, and if it's above, that means he's slower. So as you can see on this line, it's pretty flat. Like, obviously, there's a little bit of up and down here and there as the lap will vary a little bit, of course. But it's only later on in the lap when Alonso gets DRS of someone uh, and he's going, like, literally 50... Like, oh my God, he's literally going, like, 25 kph faster in a straight line. <laughs> only then he starts gaining, like, two or three tenths per, per straight. Otherwise, it's a pretty flat line, which, honestly, super impressive job from Lance Stroll. Mm. Um, and it's I not just... Think... You, you mentioned he couldn't walk. It's also just for those who... I mean, everyone should be aware at this point, but if you yeah, don't I mean, know, he did a, He broke both his wrists. Had yeah, bones and in he both had a uh, leg then, injury as well at yeah, the same time. He had injury, a cycling accident. Broken toe, yeah. He had pins inserted <laughs> into one of his wrists. Sorry, if you don't like was, medical it stuff. Gnarly, it's too late yeah. now. <laughs> yeah, it's too late now. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. No, it, it not, it does not, it does not any more than this, luckily. Yeah. There's no yeah. more content. We're good. But it, it, he was in a really uh, tough position after If that was me, you accident, would not so. hear from me for weeks. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, like like she was saying, it was a super difficult thing for Lance to deal with. And the fact that he's bounced back so hard. Yeah. Um, and we even saw him in practice. And he's on the pace. Yeah, the like pace. in, yeah, in practice, FP1. As, as said, 
FP2 was He was like juggling the wheel to try and like he couldn't turn his <laughs> wrist like that so he was like He had to take his hand off the wheel when mm. he shouldn't have needed to do that. And uh, even on the radio uh, his engineer who is now not Brad uh, was saying um, Lance for the exit of turn 2 could you compromise the en- uh, could you compromise turn 1 a little bit and stay tight on the exit. He's like, I can't like, no, with, man, the I can't, man. with the with hands I can't man. <laughs> um and yeah it was it was like it's super impressive for him to be so yeah. on the pace after especially after not doing pre-season testing. Yeah. Guys these even Felipe Drugovic, Fernando Alonso, they both done like two, three hundred laps in this yeah. car at this track. Like the fact that this guy's come in with zero laps and he's so yeah. close. And insane, the, insane the worst potential. thing is people are just going to look at that, you know, yeah, that lap the start one incident. incident and just negate all of his. And the fact um, that Fernando was on the podium and this guy was on P6. Yeah. Yeah. Like, but honestly, that's that's what we're here for. Massive effort from Lance. That's yeah, exactly. We're here, we we're here to, to the, highlight to the yeah. the under under appreciated Unsung stories. Heroes. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> um, and my second uh, honorable mention driver of the day candidate is Pia Gasly. Um, everyone saw at the last lap; uh, they noticed <laughs> he has gained eleven positions of his. He started last and he finished uh, in the points. So that is huge. I mean, <laughs> if. Alpine needed a morale boost after what happened to Esteban, and I think that's the perfect one they can give, especially the fact that he's the new driver to the team. Esteban knows the knows the Alpine uh, philosophy better than uh, Pierre does, of course. So the fact that Pierre could also get in and do so well <clears throat> will be a super big morale boost for the whole team, including Esteban as well. The, um, obviously, it'll be super frustrating for him, but he knows it was a penalty thing. It was not him just driving badly. Yeah. Um, and there is this potential to get more points uh, in this very long season that we have. So yeah. uh, I would have to say Lance Stroll and Esteban Ocon, I mean, uh, and Pierre Gasly, Pierre sorry, Gasly. <laughs> are my two candidates for okay. uh, honorable mentions of driver of the day. But you overall would say Alonso? Um, it's, or... Yeah, overall, I, I would have to say Alonso, yeah. Of okay, course. yeah. There it's we tough go. to so, argue against that so one. So Neil's driver of the day is Fernando Alonso. Now, I actually would, not that I disagree, I agree. Alonso is the driver of the day. But personally... I would actually probably pick someone different. Um, someone you didn't actually mention either for an honourable mention. Mm-hmm. And you're going to think who I'm going to say, and you're probably thinking I'm going to say Alex Albon. But that's yes, actually I not the case. <laughs> I, I can not? see okay. on your face, you're like, oh no, here she goes. Go like, on, <laughs> I'm actually not going to pick Alex. So he would get an honourable mention from me. He didn't do anything mm-hmm. like crazy special, but yeah, you know, points but in a Williams. Thing as well. It wasn't particularly spectacular. He just drove yeah. his race and it, yeah. bo- it worked out for him. So now, good I'm performance, also, but I wouldn't I am, say it's like, whoa, amazing. Yeah. No, I, I'm actually going to pick someone who did just drive their race. And that's actually mm-hmm. Max Verstappen. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, yeah, so I guess. He, I mean, sure. he did nothing wrong. He did not put a foot wrong. He, he yeah, yeah. was dominant, not just today, but all weekend. You know, like qualifying, pole, topping all the sessions. Just, you know. Alonso. But, not, um, not practice. Not practice, but that's yeah, practice. No, but, but like... He was point, the guy like, to beat all I mean, weekend. It was the way the he Red just... Bull was so far ahead. Yeah. And Checo was not as quick as Max. So yeah. at that point... But that's the thing. Max was just perfectly. so quick. He drove perfectly. He yeah. drove perfectly. Pure perfection. Yeah. It was even like after lap one, you could just see he just pulled away. Like there was yeah. no catching him. He was him. gone. He was and that's gone. like, we've not even mentioned him this race beyond his good start yeah. on lap one. Because he was that far ahead. We didn't he even... Was... He we just like forgot he was there. Like, oh yeah. yeah, oh yeah, there's Max as well. It was somewhere. kind of reminiscent of um, Theo Pocher in Formula 2 today. Yes, earlier, earlier today. He, yeah, because yeah. he just, you just forget they're in he, the he, race. In fact, it's how... exactly, it was pretty yeah. much exactly the same situation <laughs> because uh, the reason Theo's gap was so big was because the fight for second, third, fourth was so much closer. And so these guys kept fighting each other, taking taking their own tires out to keep the position and then going yeah. side by side to compromise their lines. Meanwhile, Theo was just driving his line. Same He's with Max. A good time. So yes, that's same, why, exactly the same thing. I Max. personally would say Max Verstappen is my personal driver of the day, just because I don't think he could have done a single thing to improve. No, that. for sure, that makes um, sense, definitely. And Alonso would also be my se- my second pick, very very close. I think the main thing I could give any flaw to Alonso's driving was just that he let Lewis. Well, he didn't let Lewis through, but Lewis was able to get through. Um, on yeah, yeah. Lap one. But it's one, and I know that's that, really like, harsh. Inevitable. I, it, yeah. No, no, no. It, 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 I, I see where you're coming from. If it's everyone just, it's okay. was it's saying, yeah, it's one of those things. If everyone was saying Max driver of the day, I'd be saying Alonso. It's one yeah, of those things sure. where I feel for like sure, they both sure. drove so well, and I'm, I'm only really saying Max because no one is at the moment. So, yeah. um, and I feel like he does deserve a recognition for he definitely just does, a perfect yeah. drive. Basically, this, this, this kind of drive from Max is definitely the kind of one that. 
it's it's only going to get the true appreciation it deserves when we're looking back at the season as a whole whether that be yeah. at the end of this year or maybe even many years down the line yeah this kind of incredibly dominant performance is not yeah. really one that people tend to notice in the moment cuz it's kind of boring yeah um, exactly but he would, it's one he, yeah. for, one for the record books definitely yeah definitely all right so let me just have a quick look and see what our next one is cuz i have forgotten ah oh, best uh, move stop. oh best move oh shit yes. we only done one holy shit okay yeah <laughs> You may go ahead. Okay. So our next category is best move, which goes to the the driver that made the best move or the team, well, really. Whoever made the be- the, the best move award goes to it whoever goes made to the, the best move. Made the best move, no way. <laughs> I could That's not crazy. have guessed. Yeah, I mean we picked some pretty good names here. Very self-explanatory. Yeah, yeah, very, very, very good. Um, so I'll let you go first again cuz I feel yeah, like I, I, I think, don't I think have a lot to say. <laughs> I, I honestly, I think we both agree on this one. Shall we say it at uh, the Fernando same time? Alonso, okay, we're not. I already said it. My apologies. It's Alonso okay. and Hamilton. I was thinking in that too. That was yeah. <laughs> was it clean. was a good move. It was a very yeah. good move. Uh, um, it was one of those things where it's like the <clears throat> Alonso was definitely running a higher down first setup than uh, Mercedes was. Yeah. Um, or that Lewis specifically was. I I didn't actually check what Jared is doing, but then Hamilton definitely. Um, so. he definitely knew he had to do it in sector 2 rather than uh, the first or third sector cuz the straights he just wasn't up to pace on those yeah. compared to the corners where he was on the entry gaining a lot to the mercedes so unconventional move definitely in turn 10 but it's the perfect kind of it's, it's literally so perfect right? cuz like getting getting someone on the entry is what he needs to do so why not do it on the entry to where no one else does it on the entry yeah it, it perfect. just makes sense I I completely done. agree with you. I don't think I could name a better move really. So let's move on to a very similar category and I feel like we're both going to have the same answer for this again that possibly yeah. relates to the previous category. This one best this category battle. is going <laughs> this category best battle is going to be a lot more interesting in subsequent episodes I'm sure. Yes. Yes. Cuz today my answer is going to be Alonso Hamilton. Yeah, my my answer is also Alonso Hamilton. That one There's was There's a contender with Alonso signs but Hamilton yeah. was a bit more interesting. I do also like, want <laughs> a bit of a joke on a of all mention for this category of best battle uh Lando versus his car that and was Oscar, <laughs> and Oscar yeah Lando was more whole, drawn out though yeah, yeah. <laughs> McLaren versus their drivers versus um, the car, honestly yeah so Even the team members are like guys turn it off and on again guys we need yeah. this and it just wouldn't it just wouldn't work um yeah so yeah I, I mean the usual pretty obvious one there I'd say Alonso yeah. and Hamilton It's that was just that one move of course was amazing but yeah but, It, it was being set up you know the the reason yeah. in my mind especially that it stands out is because it we, is we were the waiting. culmination of like a, a while of that battle panning out yeah. where uh, one driver tries one thing which uh, disables the opportunity to do another thing for another driver and then he uses that opportunity to create an opening in the next corner but unfortunately the exit wasn't good enough so all of that culminated into that one over turn 10 so that's yeah. it's a good battle it's a very good battle yeah. guys it was you it was watch good it yeah. if you haven't But I'm sure everyone has. <laughs> yeah. like, if you watch, if you watch an hour of this podcast already and you haven't watched the race, like, like what are you doing? Really? Seriously? Like, <laughs> like, what was going on here? <laughs> um. Okay. So moving on to our next category, which is I don't. Re- it re- there's a lot of options for this one, but flop of the I week. I think there's one which is much more than the other. Flop others, of the maybe. week is our next category. So just to explain this one, by flop I mean just someone who's really. not performed to standards or like could be a team could be a driver just anything yeah, that's just, gone just wrong. anyone who's had a bad day yeah. anyone who's had a bad day if you've and, had a bad, bad day like made research. a bad moment bad decision it's in sports bad days happen bad days it, happen it, exactly like, we're we not are, trying to hate to on anyone yeah exactly we're just here to you know we're giving awards out a, for the good stuff let's have a yeah. little giggle at whoever's messed and up as we <laughs> as everyone knows as wise philosophers have said when you appreciate when you notice the bad times it makes you appreciate the good times so much more This is deep. Neil Bursa for truly, this. Truly, truly. Um, so <laughs> you can go ahead first, I think. Okay. Um, so Fluff is a week. I think you're going to say the same as me, but McLaren as a team. Yes. In general. I, I, I do. Um, I do agree with that. Just, I guess the way the cars panned out. Um, yeah. They were so slow and the car yeah. didn't even work at that pace. Like it, it, it was just a big mess. It was a big mess. Both of their drivers in different ways. Yeah. Piastri's just kind of switched off. <laughs> it just yeah. said no. He couldn't even get it to turn back on. Yeah. Again. 
Um, and um, Landis had the yeah. pneumatic valve problem. Which ruined and, his um, race. Honorable mention for Flop of the Week would be Esteban. Yes. Because things, <laughs> one thing went wrong, which made the next thing go wrong, and the next thing go wrong, and the next thing go wrong, and then you just yeah. gave up, which is fair play. Yeah. Um, but I would still say McLaren takes the yeah. cake for this one. And Flop Esteban at least did well in qualifying. He was very strong yeah. in quali. Yeah, yeah, yeah. McLaren was uh, bad there as well. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so shout out to Esteban, honorable Flop. But not, not, uh, not, didn't flop as hard. He's going to have though. to flop a bit harder for us to notice yeah, him, he's unfortunately. Gonna try, he has, to, has to try harder next time <laughs> for the title. And finally, we have our most kind of random category, which is Hidden Gem. So Hidden Gem is going to highlight something that's happened in the F1 world through the race week at any point. Something that maybe not everyone's realised has actually happened. Maybe just something a bit more small that's gone under the radar. Something kind of like unique or something that might get forgotten about in future maybe just weeks later everyone will have forgotten so you know if you ever want to come back and find what our hidden gem for each race was you probably would enjoy going oh yeah that happened so something small and nice so neil i'll spring this on you do you have any idea of what you'd have as your hidden gem this weekend i honestly don't but then again i also didn't actually consume any of the off-track stuff given the fact that i was busy until like today yeah. But I did notice that you were enjoying this one TikTok, which I personally can't yes. watch because I'm in India and TikTok is blocked. So Fix it, India! Go ahead and tell us about that. Problem. I mean, TikTok is TikTok's fault, probably not India's fault. Both of them. Fix both it, of them. both it's a long of you. Story, yeah. So I don't think it's up. Yes. So I guess I'll I'll leave yours blank for hidden gem unless you have That's anything right, else. Yeah. Um, so my hidden gem is Fernando Alonso joining TikTok, um, which I think he did join prior to this race weekend, but uh, well, to this race week. Um, but actually, very recently, he did post a very entertaining TikTok, that, or just one that was kind of causing a bit of a, a laugh in the community, like laughing with him kind of thing. Okay. My honest <laughs> reaction for that. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's pretty odd. Right? He's then, really been leaning into the, the whole like Sigma memes as of Yeah, late. and like... He was doing the, the gritty, the gritty. <laughs> which was, I think that was like a week ago. Um, yeah, that oh was in testing. That, so. That's a classic <laughs> clip. Oh my God. That's, so, one for the, that's, that's, one, that's one of the clips of all time, easily. So for me, that's my hidden gem of the week. That's something to, I, I, to look back so on hidden, and smile. I forgot about Alonso hitting the gritty. That was, that was something else. Oh my God. So there oh we go. God. So hidden gem is my personal favorite category because, yeah, what a moment. It's generally, uh, especially when, what uh, like, it's one of those things which like, it's so much, like, there's so much fun to be had while yeah. looking at the smaller stuff, uh, yeah. which obviously just gets forgotten when we're looking back on yeah. the stats, you know? And, like, I there love no consuming... of how sturdy Fernando Alonso got when he took at Bayern testing. But now exactly. we know, because we have we, this lovely book to document all this. And, like, there's so many, there's 20 different drivers that are all getting up to different things, 10 different teams also all doing different things. All with you many cannot, different stuff. You cannot stuff. consume it all. You just cannot. Absolutely. And there's like... definitely going to be some funny moments all the, over the place. Yeah. So, so that is yeah, I'm really nice. excited as the season goes on to see some of these moments and highlight them to people that maybe weren't aware or just people that want to think, oh yeah, that happened and have a nice laugh and a nice memory yeah. of it. Um, I guess that pretty much takes us to the end of this episode. I feel like we've pretty much said everything we have yeah, to say I, about this I think race. That's pretty much everything. Plus, uh, I, I look extra raggedy because I've been talking for the past hour and it is now 1.48 a.m. <laughs> Wow, See, dedication, India. dedication, dedication yes, I'm, I'm all the way from the, India. <laughs> I'm incredibly dedicated podcaster in yes. the motorsport world. Thank you guys um, for listening to my yeah. insane ramblings about racing. We have I loved love listening racing, to you. I love racing. <laughs> we love racing here. Um, and that's the thing, you know, you wouldn't be watching this if you don't love racing. So. Oh yeah, you would yeah. not be <laughs> an hour or whatever, how much One of us, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Oh. So, thank you if you've made it this far. You're awesome. You are definitely one of us. <laughs> yeah. So, be sure to smash that like button and rate five stars on iTunes, guys. <laughs> thank you. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> I got the, the spirit of a YouTuber took over. Sorry, for a second. I I mean, honestly, you've hit the nail on the head there, Neil. Um, if you Ring that this... notification bell, guys. <laughs> be Don't sure. forget. <laughs> be sure to like and subscribe. <laughs> Neil and said ring so. Ring that bell. Oh, and also, while we're on the topic of Fernando Alonso's TikTok, I'm also on TikTok. So do do I'm drop late, me a... But I, I obviously can't open <laughs> it as of late. But I am. I am. I am. Technically, I am. I have an account and it, he it has, has an account content on it. And I have tagged him a few times. <laughs> yes. And I have posted content. It's just currently I can't open it because... Yes. Well, I mean, I can get a VPN, but it's too much effort. Yeah. I'm on so, Instagram, though. Yes. 
follow us on our socials instagram tiktok twitter neil versus racing read it